is an interesting criticism. And we'd also expect to see maybe tolerance of ambiguity as a factor there, because that predicts uh, openness to altered states of consciousness. And that's one of the factors we'd really expect to make a difference in people's uh, approach. And there's a bunch of other stuff, such as fantasy proneness uh, and uh, meditators, uh, med people who've had previous meditative experience or not. I don't know what your experience is, but I find that some meditators really like sound and technology, and others really can't stand it. They find it intrusive and very objectionable, and they don't like it. Very interesting question. One of the other points that I want to raise, because this is happening in California now, and I think that we've been kind of hovering around this point for some time. I've seen this point float in and out of the presentation, is what happens if an individual gets uncomfortable at a certain flicker frequency? Now, we could take it, a la uh, Len Ox, that this was one of the gap areas where they weren't functioning. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Or we could take it that there was resistance at that frequency. Now, the fascinating thing is that there are now therapists in California who take people deliberately to the frequency where they're uncomfortable and then back it off a little bit and then start to ask the people, what are you feeling? What are you thinking at this time? And the thesis is that at the frequency of discomfort you've hit some form of unconscious material and that what you will do is, if you keep on at that frequency, is you will then threaten to get that through straight off into consciousness in an unmodified form. If you back off it, then you're allowing the person a little bit more control over the process of the eruption of this material and so it's less threatening. This is just a hypothesis, but it's fascinating, and they are using a Lumatron right now to actually do that. I'll take questions later. Okay, I'm just about pretty well finished. I want to uh, just outline one, because I don't want to take too much time. I want to outline two quick considerations. Consideration number one is, I'm a philosopher too, a philosopher of science. So far you've had my consciousness side. What would happen if we talked to my classical uh, philosophy of science side, I would say, well, in the progress of the science, the first conference is usually full of scientific papers. It founds a journal. At that point, people become members of an association. PhDs get done in universities. Professorships in that area become established, and it grows as a subspecialization, and it's reached scientific respectability. Are we at that stage? No. We seem to have an industry where we're selling the goods before the science has been produced to actually justify the sales of the goods in some respects. Is that unique? No. People were riding in steam engines long before Carnot's cycle and all of the thermodynamics of steam engine or any other form of engine had been worked out. So we have essentially a magical technology. That's a lovely word for what we're doing. Uh, so, this, so what I want to say is, sooner or later that's going to happen. And you people should have a voice in how that social formation takes place. Because science is a social process, and we want that to happen under our aegis where it can develop the field safely rather than get cut off or grabbed by the FDA and licensed over to the medical profession, because that is really not appropriate. Finally, I want to, point, I want to mention a book which I think is seminal in terms of theories of consciousness, which is Charles Tart's book, which is not altered states of consciousness, but his smaller book called States of Consciousness. And what Tart says here are some really crucially important factors to understand consciousness with, and I will leave us with these thoughts, and I'm going to take about six minutes. So I want to get Robert a little bit tired before he actually comes and uh, bumps me off the stage here. He's doing a great, doing a great job here. But I want, you, I want to take you through, because this is, this is something that really excites me, and I want to share my excitement, because I think that this book is something, especially for people who've read Megabrain, that is like the next step, and very important for us to understand, because it allows us to understand what we're doing. And we are, collectively, a very creative group. First of all, Tart says, consciousness is not the same as pure awareness. Consciousness is not, quote, natural, Consciousness is a cultural artifact. Each culture defines certain states of consciousness that they allow to exist. And so the normal state of consciousness, 
nsc, for those of you who like ah acronyms, the nsc is permitted culturally and in western culture the nsc is characterized in certain ways it's rational it has a certain form of attentional focus and this has been criticized by lester fermi and others the attentional focus is very narrow it's very focused it's very analytical it's very critical distant from the object which is being perceived and it is very stressful because it doesn't bring in a consciousness of the wider global context including ourselves so we get up in our heads and we also get divorced from the co wider context and we get stressed because we're just pointing this consciousness in a very tight beam. It's narrow, tight, stressful, distant and critical and evaluative. But also, because the normal state of consciousness is a psychological construct, it is subject to psychological factors. And here, uh, being from a university with two major clinical psychological programs, I'm very aware of the interaction of family environment with consciousness. Very many, I think, of the girls who have attention deficit disorder, typically girls who have attention deficit disorder present differently from boys. The boys are hyperactive and act out. The girls are dreamy and drift around in fantasy and are unfocused. And when they've done research with those groups, they've found that a high frequency of the girls have been sexually molested or incested or sexually abused or physically abused in childhood and that the attention deficit state of consciousness is a defense where they go out of their body and into fluffy, fluffy land because they can't deal with the real reality of what they're presented with. And therefore, the whole issue of states of consciousness, your, our states of consciousness are partly defensive constructions. And this is something that we don't normally understand. And yet it's a crucial factor, especially in this culture where you know, in Western culture, we have such problems with our family. That's putting it mildly. But the normal state of consciousness is also busy. It's busy, 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 because we want to retain the reality that's safe. So we keep loading into consciousness all of these thoughts and all of the stuff that's going on. The M band, the beta above 15 cycles, whatever, that we maintain this busy construct, just as Carlos Castaneda was taught by Don Juan, you sustain the world. The reciprocal relationship between reality and consciousness comes in here once again. And so the state of consciousness is busy and the defensive structures consume a lot of our energy. Now, consciousness, therefore, is a system. And this is the crucial core of Tart's view. Consciousness is a system and it has system properties. And within consciousness, there are structures which we can identify which perform specific functions. And in order to produce an altered state of consciousness, you have to destabilize the normally homeostatically maintained relationship between the structures. And you do that by overloading them or underloading them. If you overload them, as Tom was talking about, primitive drug, drumming, terrible fatigue, terrible pain, terrible uh, cold, whatever, all of these incredible shamanistic things overload consciousness. But equally, in the quiet of a float chamber, or in a Gunsfeld, we unload consciousness. And in many ways, sound light de devices underload consciousness. They do so by presenting a monotonous but pleasant stimulus. And this is how I think sound and light machines produce theta. Not by a form of direct driving. We found in the research I did that we got plenty of theta from sound and light machines. We didn't get it at the frequency that the machine was going because what I think happens is that if you shut down the, the input to the human being, they no longer be vigilant. They don't have to be vigilant. We forget. It's only the last 2,000 years where we had cities. Before that, we were meat on the hoof for any passing predator. And so as a result, as a prey animal, it behoved us to be very aware of our environment and vigilant when we were awake. When we crept into our little caves at night and were safe, we could allow ourselves to go internal to start processing, and that's essentially what a sound and light machine is producing. It's produ you know, people have talked about the shamanic effect. I want to say it's our portable cave. We go back into our cave, and we start the process of internalization of attention, of moving into fantasy, the uh, rest and, and repair response instead of the stress response. 
And that is a very positive thing because we know that it has lots of good effects on uh, the human brain, body, and mind. Uh, the relaxation response and the work of Benson Herbert uh, very clearly um, uh, illustrates that. So the system finally has a number of ways in which we can destabilize it, and then it goes into chaos. And this is where Prigiagine's view of the chaotic nature of change emerges and responds to it. Because in that chaos, you can then apply patterning stimuli, which repattern the structures of consciousness into a different system. So you chaoticize the system, move it into chaos, repattern it, and it comes out as an altered state. When it goes back into the normal state, it goes back into an area of chaos and then re-emerges as, as a normal state. And you notice very often that people cannot give an account of the change from a normal state into an altered state, although they can talk about the characteristics of the normal state and then the characteristics of the altered state. And that's probably a symptom of the fact that in this chaos, the, the system cannot do very much computing at all. It's not able to keep its act together. Finally, what I want to do is, just for fun, list to you, because I think this can be an interesting thing for you to ask your pals, the ten factors which Charles Tart and his graduate students suggested to him were sorts of measures of, am I in an altered state or not? What kinds of things would I notice in order to know whether or not I was in an altered state or not? 